Thank you so much for joining us for the virtual symposium, The Other Slavery, Histories of Indian Bondage from New Spain to the Southwestern United States. My name is Michelle Delaney. I am the Assistant Director for History and Culture at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. This symposium is the first in a series of future continued discussions on the global impact of enslavement of indigenous peoples in the Americas presented by the Smithsonian Institution. The Latino Center, National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the National Museum of the American Indian have come together to collaborate and bring these hidden stories of the Americas and enslavement of native peoples to the forefront of US history. This first symposium on New Spain, its Asian colonies, and the Southwestern United States. It will examine the global enslavement practices that subjugated indigenous peoples and explores the interracial and intercultural relationships impacted by the enslavement of native peoples in what is now the United States of America. Our next symposium will continue the discussion about California history with a focus on missions and the role of religion in the enslavement of indigenous peoples, but also the use of genocide to destroy their cultures while taking land and resources. We are lucky today to have Chairman Greg Saris of the Grayton Rancheria community to talk about what we will present in our next and future sessions on the history of California and an introduction to Indian bondage there. Thank you. Hello, I am Greg Saris, Chairman of the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria, and I'm going to do a very brief overview of Indian slavery here in California. The slavery began as it did in most of the New World with uh, the coming of the Spanish, and in our case, specifically with the Spanish missions. Father uh, Junipero Serra, and along with the Spanish army, uh, began in Southern California in San Diego to move north, building missions. The, mis the goal was to gain souls for heaven and land for the Spanish crown. As they moved north, they forced Indian people into the missions. Um, uh, there is discussion that some of the Indian people initially went in freely, but um, that soon began to change. And you may want to think about the situation as two phases of uh, the mission period, that mission period up to 1800, where there were some Indians that were going in, and then the period after 1800, where so many Indian people had been dying in the missions that the Spanish soldiers went further and further into the Central Valley and other areas and forcibly marched Indians back into the missions to maintain the mission and the ranches and the economy of the missions. In the New World, it was supposed the Spanish were supposedly anti-slavery, but as in South and Central America, as here, they got around that by using indentured servitude, vagrancy laws, and convict leasing. Essentially what the missions did is they forced us into the missions saying, of course, it wasn't slavery, but uh, that uh, it was part of a larger system and they used these kind of tenants, if you will, to justify the enslavement or explain the enslavement of indigenous people um, here in California and of course throughout South and Central America. Um, then the missions were secularized in 1834. Um, at the, after the Mexican Revolution, several years after the Mexican Revolution. And the, Mexi the huge land grants were given to Mexican generals. And the Mexican generals created what we might want to call this ranchero culture. And they, very, they also used the same tenants. Those indigenous people who survived the minute of, of the missions were um, brought in and, and forcibly used forcibly to work in the, on the ranchos. Uh, and again, these rancheros used the same tenants, once again, indentured servitude, vagrancy laws, and convict leasing. 
so that if an indigenous person was walking on a road or seen somewhere and did not have documentation that he or she was working for one of the ranches, one of the ranches, they could be put in jail and sold and so on and so forth. Again, using those tenants um, to enslave the indigenous people. In 1850, Cal that brings us up then to 1850. And in 1850, here comes, well, in eight, late 18, uh, 1847 or so, the Bear Flag Revolution, um, where the Americans defeated the Mexicans here. And um, largely, again, more and more people from the East were coming into California, coming over and around the Rockies into California. Gold was discovered and things began to really boom here. Um, but then the first piece of legislation enacted in the state of California in 1850 was again, the government for the protection the act for the government and protection of Indians, which legalized Indian slavery using those same tenants once again. And the horrible and strange irony here is General Vallejo, who was defeated by the first governor of California in the Bear Flag Revolution, helped that governor design that first piece of legislation. He basically said, here is what you do with the Indian people that are here um, uh, and how you enslave them. California took it one step further and added to the, those three tenants a fourth, which basically said that with the permission of the Indian parents, Indian children could go with whomever uh, to be trained or whatever, basically to be enslaved, which resulted in the murder of many Indian parents who were here. At the same time, the, the gold rush was on. And again, more and more, more, uh, Americans were coming into the territory and uh, the governor of California was able to get funds, federal funds uh, from the federal government to basically fund vigilante groups to kill Indians and in particularly in the gold uh, mining areas of the Central Valley and uh, Foothills. Um, and that resulted in again, mass murder at the same time there was mass enslavement. A lot of the early American ranch owners, a setter among them, um, would hold large Indians as slaves, lock them up at night, and so on and so forth. Um, and when this law, the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, was not repealed until 1868, three years after the end of the Civil War. But even after that, there continued to be paid vigilante groups to kill Indian people. And the way Indians survived, were able to survive here in California is to indenture themselves to landowners, American landowners who could protect them and basically say to these marauding vigilante groups and others that these Indians belong to me, they're my workers, don't touch them, leave them alone. Um, and so well after the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians was repealed, there was still forms of indentured servitude um, where Indians for their own safety had to either marry or become a concubine of uh, one of these early landowners. Uh, and that continued well right up into the 20th century, basically until um, 1910 when Congress passed the California Indian Rancheria Act, which was created to, to create reservations or small rancherias for the so-called homeless Indians of California. So they'd have a place to go uh, uh, besides being essentially indentured to landowners. Um, and that is a nutshell of the history here of enslavement uh, in California. Um, just to put it a little bit in perspective, uh, my people are comprised of Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok in Southern Sonoma County and Marin counties here, just north of San Francisco. And there were many nations here, but at the time of contact, there were about 20,000 of us. Um, and today, all of their nearly 1,500 enrolled members, we trace our ancestry back to one of 14 survivors, all of whom were women, all of whom were concubines or wives of the early Americans. Again, uh, I'm Greg Saris. 
uh, chairman of the Federated Indians of Grand Rancheria, uh, providing you a nutshell picture of the slavery here in California, what was going on west of the Rockies.